We're continuing with our series, My Best Friend, the Holy Spirit. And you know, Jesus really wants us to walk so close to God that He sent us a personal counselor. How many of you need counseling once in a while? Am I the only one? <laughs> okay. You get a personal counselor through the person and the work of the Holy Spirit that will help us and remind us of all things, show us all things. And we've been talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. And many people think there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the... I'm not quite sure who that person is but we're not supposed to get involved with that. That's how some people grow up that way. And maybe you grew up in a church where it was totally ignored or it was all that was talked about. But I wanted to remind us of a few key elements this morning that we've been talking about. And if you want to catch up online, go to cornerstonecheshire.com. It should be hopefully caught up real soon. You can catch up on all the different series. This series has been interrupted through guest speakers a little bit. But we're continuing with it today. And today we're going to talk about something that has no controversy at all. We're going to talk about tongues. So, I'm excited about it, by the way. I'll explain to you in a few moments. But before we get into that, I want to tell you right off the bat, I want you all to relax because we're not going to lock the doors and force you to, you know, until you speak in tongues, you can't leave. We're not going to do any of that. I want to encourage you to forget about what you've learned in the past and kind of let it go. Let's look at the Scripture and see what God has to say through the Scriptures. And I'll explain to you a little bit why there has been this unnecessary opportunity of division. There's no need for it. And I'll explain the reason why. First of all, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit and how Jesus came to the planet Earth for basically two main reasons. The first reason was to be the sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the earth. That all of us have blown it. All of us have made mistakes. He's called the second Adam. And the beautiful thing is, you can read about it in, in great explicit detail in Philippians chapter 2, God laid down all of, his, all of his strength and all of his rights as God and became a human being like you and I. He literally said, I'm going to leave it all behind. I'm going to become flesh and blood, and everything I'm going to do, I'm going to have to do in flesh and blood. The only difference, however, with Jesus is he was perfect, and he was God. Uh, there's no one here that's perfect, and there's no one here that's God. But he was 100% man and 100% God. So everything Jesus did, he had to do through the same limitations that you and I have. Now, in the two purposes of Jesus, if Jesus came to the planet Earth as a sinless, sacrificial lamb, all right, let's say he never did a miracle, never walked on water, never raised anyone from the dead, never opened blind eyes or deaf ears, uh, never fed the 5,000. All he did was he came and he went to the cross and he would have died for our sins. My, my friends, all of us would still be saved. That is the absolutely most important thing that Jesus did. But how many people know that's not all that he did? A lot of people in the church, it's all they emphasize. And that is the most important. Nothing else matters without that. True. But he also came to declare the kingdom of heaven. He also came to inaugurate a new day where people would hear about the gospel, that blind eyes would open, deaf ears would open. And that he would do miracles and the Holy Spirit would lead him to do many, many things. And he did tremendous things as a result. In fact, everything Jesus did, he did by the leading of God the Father and the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, what happened, well, I'm just giving you a little review because this is really key, okay? What happened was when Jesus was 30 years old, he went to the River Jordan. Went to the River Jordan. The Bible says when John baptized him, the heavens rendered open and the Holy Spirit came down like a dove, not a dove, a like a dove, and it descended upon him and remained on him and the Spirit led him. From that point forward, Jesus operated in the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything he did, he did by the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he said to his disciples, it's to your advantage that I I could go, that I go away so I can send him to you, which blows me away. Jesus did not begin his earthly ministry until he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. And yet he says, I don't want you leaving Jerusalem until he comes. And we spoke about that last time we were together. You can go back and you can catch up with all that. And we talked about that. I'm not going to re-preach that, but I wanted to at least bring you up to speed what we've been talking about here. So... Jesus wants all of us to be infilled with power. Then why on earth is this a, a controversy? It does not need to be a controversy. Let me just tell you something again. I'll reiterate something. If you're the enemy, if the enemy can't get us to reject Jesus Christ and reject our salvation, then he wants to make us inept and powerless, right? 
So what he wants to do is say, listen, you don't need the Holy Spirit. All you need is salvation. Don't worry about spiritual gifts. Don't worry about laying hands on the sick. Don't worry about being bold and going beyond yourself. That's all of the devil. That's all of me. <laughs> but I, you know, and, and that's from the past. It doesn't apply today. And that's what begins to happen. And unfortunately, people end up being weak. Or on the other side, well, we have it already. And we're going to talk about that next time we come together. I'm going to talk about how do you continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time event, my friends. Something gets installed in your life, and then you have to continue with the relationship with the Holy Spirit. But let me give you a little history lesson, just a really brief one. In 1904, there was something called the Welch Revival. And what happened was the manifestations of the Holy Spirit became to be uh, happening, including tongues and, and, and prophecy and all that, and eventually that's what happened. And then it ended up spraying to Topeka, uh, to Topeka, Kansas, and then it eventually had its real stronghold where God really broke out in Azusa Street in California in 1906, and the person that, it, that God used was a one-eyed African-American man by the name of William Seymour, who had no education, but God used this man they were praying for revival and the God that changed the planet, and the Holy Spirit fell. You cannot manufacture something like this. And as a result of this revival that went on for a number of years, is that people from all around the world came in, and uh, rich, poor, black, white, Hispanic, all creeds, all nationalities were touched by this. And the people uh, were filled with power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, they went all around the world. Do you, and that's what they call Pentecostals. That's where the word came from, charismatics, full gospel. And uh, there was different uh, organizations that began. The AG Fellowship, of Samuel's God Fellowship began, which we're part of. Uh, also the Pentecostal um, United Church in Christ and uh, um, a bunch of other largest denominations of Pentecostal churches came to know that. In fact, do you know that today there's over 580 million, 580 million people that were as a result of this outbreak of the Holy Spirit, a rediscovery what was kind of forgotten about. All around the world, this is the largest group of Christians, only second to Catholicism, and it's growing every day. It has inaugurated one of the greatest mission movements in the planet. Because it was not about sitting around blessing each other. It was about going out there and, and, and utilizing it to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you what happened a little bit, okay? What happened was people started doing these things. And people got intimidated by it. And so they say, well, that's of the devil. No, it's not. And once you get in an argument with somebody, what do you tend to do? You tend to exaggerate your point to make your point, right? And the next thing you know, it came to a point, and unless you have the initial physical evidence, you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't need that. I have everything that Jesus gave me. And it all became about this arguing back and forth. Instead of being a benefit, it became a bone of contention. Really highly unnecessary. Unfortunately, and, and even I experienced this growing up a little bit. I went to some churches, and I wanted all that God had for me. So they brought me up front, and, and you know, and this guy prayed for me, slapped his head, his hand on my head, and my I don't know, like this, and I fell to the floor, and, and he started praying for me, and, and everyone gathered around me. Come on, speak in tongues, speak in tongues, speak in tongues. I'm like, leave me alone. So I said, shoulda bought a Honda, shoulda bought a Honda, leave me alone, right? And so I got turned off by that. But then there are other times I was prayed for. And I could not stand. The Holy Spirit came upon me such, I was, I was overwhelmed by His presence. And later on in my life, I was prayed for. And the Holy Spirit came upon me and I spoke with other tongues. You see, and well-meaning people, right? But there becomes an argument about it. And it should not be an argument. It's an opportunity. And so I want to tell you today that God wants to bless us all. And there's been confusion between the, pub, between the public gift and the private grace. All nine of the Holy Spirit gifts are available to everybody. All of you are teachers, all that, right? But not everyone's a professional teacher. All can prophesy, but you not, may not be a prophet in the office. All pastor of the people doesn't mean that you are a pastor of a church, you see? And so today I hope to, to hope to take the myth out of it and take the wonder of, of disagreement out and realize this is an opportunity for us to become what God has called us to become. Then why are you bringing this up for? Why it's so important? Why can't, you, why can't you just leave the tongues alone? Because I can't leave tongues alone because the Bible says do not forbid it. And so I would be doing spiritual mal malpractice, not preaching the full counsel of what the Word of God says. And so I want to let you know, personally, it's a blessing to me. I want to help you all understand what it's all about. But I also wanted to reiterate something really careful today. 
When the Apostle Paul wrote this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he talked about in chapter 12 the nine different spiritual gifts and talked about how it's supposed to er work. Then he went to chapter 13, which talked about how you're supposed to function the spiritual gifts. And then chapter 14, he gives more explanation. You see, the Corinthian church was functioning in all the gifts, but there was a lot of divisions. So he had to bring order to it. And so I want to first start off with how do you function in all the spiritual gifts? And the Bible is thankfully very clear. Whoops. Let me go back to that again. Okay. There we go. Okay. You got to love technology. It was working right in the first service. So let me uh, try this again. Okay. Okay. Don't you love technology? Here we go. I happen to have a mouse, so the mouse is going to help me. <laughs> okay. There we go. Play. There we go. Okay. Wow, what happened? You get to see my whole sermon. Whoop. Oh, here we go quickly. See, the Holy Spirit gives more, better PowerPoints. But anyhow, let's look at the Scriptures again. And this is what the Apostle Paul is saying. And by the way, this is in the middle of a teaching about the Holy Spirit. He starts going on. And by the way, before I go any further, let me tell you about the Spirit you're supposed to work with this, the Holy Spirit, okay? Though I speak with the tongues, glossia, of men and angels, but have not love, I've become a sounding brass and a clowning cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have the gift, though I have faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So, God is saying to us, all this great stuff you want to do, it means nothing without God's love. So if you're not operating in that, you, you invalidate almost all of it. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers. Ouch. I don't want to suffer, God. Love suffers long. It is what? It is kind. Well, you don't have the spiritual gifts. Well, you're of the devil. You don't have spiritual gifts. You're of the devil. And that's not kind, right? Love, it's kind. It does not what? It does not envy. Well, they think they're better than I am. Well, they're not as good as I am. Well, if you're really spirit-filled, you'd be this way. Well, who do they think they are? All that. Well, I have the Bible. Well, I have the spirit of, the, of God. Well, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? Love does not partake, parade itself. I speak in tongues. I never forget, there was a period of time where I began to minister in Colorado, and I was praying for some young adults, and, and I was believing God for healings. It was, a, it was a moment in the church where great things were happening in a new capacity. We prayed for people, and sometimes people would be so overwhelmed with God's power, they would fall over. And so I'm like, cool, this is great, you know? So my friends started doing I started, no one, nothing, nothing happened. So finally, one day, I, I was praying in faith, and it was great, and a person just was overcome by the Lord, and they fell down. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Did it the next night, and the following night, and I'm also going like this, praise God, <laughs> look at me, look at me. I'm laying hands on people. And someone goes, oh, so you think you're hot stuff now, huh? Oh, touche. Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And I realized I did it in the wrong way. I was parading myself. Well, I speak in tongues. I do this. I was really young. I was like eight years old. No, I was, <laughs> I was about 25 years old at the time. But love suffers long. It does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Well, I function in all spiritual gifts. I'm spirit-filled and you're not. And that's just puffed up. And that's nonsense. That's not the way to do it. It's just an opportunity, right? And so that goes on. And it does not behave fruitly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but wherever there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. You see, God purposely, we, when we work in fun, on function and spiritual gifts, God will give me a little piece, we'll give you a little piece, we'll give other people a little piece. It's like a puzzle. When we all come together in unity, we see clearly because God wants us to work together. All right? But, this is the part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. So people say, well, as a result of that, uh, no longer necessary anymore. Uh, it's done away with now. Now we have the perfect thing. In 393, the canon of Scripture was complete. They had a complete uh, Bible written, and the perfect can The Bible doesn't say that. If that was the case, 
the knowledge would cease. Do we still have knowledge? People that say that don't have knowledge. But anyhow, knowledge, right? And the Bible never says that it's going to cease. And look what this Bible says here. When I was a child, right? I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man or a woman, I put away childish things. Childish things about trying to get in my way and trying to beat everyone up with, on the head with the Bible. It's not what it's about. For now, we see in a mirror. But then, face to face, now I know in part. But then I shall no, just as I'm also known. He's talking about when Christ comes back. That's when the perfect comes. Not Scripture. It's not God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible. Now, do I love the Holy Bible? Absolutely. Is it part of the Trinity? No. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three and one, okay? And the Bible says the following, and, I, and, and now abide in faith, hope, and love, and these three, but the greatest of this is love. So we're supposed to operate in spiritual gifts. People said to me, well, that's all we need is love, like the Beatles said, like the Apostle Paul McCartney said. <sighs> He's hardly an apostle. <laughs> okay? So people say, all we need is love, all we need is spiritual gifts. Look what the Bible has to say. I love it. I want it all. Pursue love. That means go after, like hot pursuit. Pursue love and desire. And the Greek word for desire is, has the connotation of like a lust. And not a bad lust, but I'm go after all the spiritual gifts. Pursue love and spiritual gifts. Not saying one or the other, both, right? Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. This is what God would have for us. I want to encourage you with that today. Now, we have children, and they were younger, and, I, and before they developed a language, they, they spoke their own language. What? What do you want? Oh, he wants a chocolate bar. How do you know that, Luke? How did you know what Hannah was saying? You know? Okay. Dad, he wants the chocolate bar. What is it with women and chocolate? Anyhow, but... Uh, <laughs> And so they would speak. You know what I'm talking about? They're just kind of babbling. You don't understand what they're saying. But Luke had the gift of interpretation. He could hear the tongues. And he gave the interpretation. And I, I tried to make a video for you. It was very difficult. As soon as I put the children on the video, they couldn't do it anymore. But, you know, how the kids talk, they, they communicate. How are you doing today? Oh, really? Do you want some corn? <laughs> you want ice cream? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so... And, and, and so the kids, they, they speak, right? Before they can speak, you can interpret what they're saying, can't you? Right? And I'm not saying that's exactly tongues, but it's kind of similar in some regards. And so please, let me share with you some things today about speaking in tongues. Why is it important for? It's a gateway gift. It's a grace that God gives us. Please don't misunderstand. We're not talking about the public gift of speaking in tongues. Just like it's because you prophesy doesn't mean you're a prophet of a church. Because you pastor someone, I mean, you're pastor, okay? Please understand, this is the personal. You'll see it in a few moments. Now, the first thing is this. Why pray in tongues in the first place? This is so controversial. Yeah, it's controversial because the enemy wants to mess us up. First thing is this. It's scriptural. It's not made up. It's scriptural. It's in the Bible. Absolutely in the Bible. And you can see right here in the scriptures, it says this. For he or she who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. So we're talking about the personal, not the public, okay? For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, what does in the Spirit mean? In the Spirit is the same as tongue. It has the same meaning. It's like you can say, Pastor Eric, he's doing all right today. So he and Pastor Eric mean the same, right? So that's what this means. In the Spirit is tongue. So he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. So notice, he speaks in tongues to God in the Spirit. Okay? It's called praying in the Spirit, folks. That's what it means. I want to continue to show you some other scriptures as we go through 1 Corinthians 14. For, it's the Apostle Paul writing, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. What happens when you pray in tongues? Your spirit prays. All right? You are, when you give your life to Christ, His Holy Spirit comes in you. When you ask to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, 
what happens is the installation of his greater flow in our life happens. Jesus says, be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We talked about the two different, three different baptisms last time we were together. Go back and listen to that. I can't do it today, all right? Verse 15. What's the conclusion then? Okay? I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding, under, understanding means mind, is unfruitful. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just speaking in tongues. Okay? Sometimes I'm speaking in English. I don't even know what I'm saying. But anyhow, what is the conclusion? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding. So what happens is when you pray in tongues, your spirit is praying to God. This is a personal grace that God has given you. And it's very interesting, the word uh, understanding, uh, 21 out of 24 times is treated, translated as mind. My mind is unfruitful. And I can tell you that I speak in tongues. I do. And when I pray in tongues, I had no idea what I'm saying. But I sense something inside of me that's beginning to be built up. It's a wonderful thing. So that's what happens. And so the Holy Spirit is, is part of that. Now, it also says this about how you are to function in the gift of all the gifts of the Holy Spirit and your personal prayer language. It says this, when you come together. When you come together, otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, which means what? Praying in tongues, right? If you pray in tongues, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen? Uninformed are people who don't know about this yet. They're believers. At your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you're saying. For you, indeed, give thanks well, but the other is not edified. All right? So I thank God. I speak in tongues more than all of you. Now, if I, if I would, to save time, if I were to, I can't do it right now, but if I asked the 10 of you to get up here on stage, and I want you to open up your favorite biblical passage. And I want to give you all a microphone, and I want you to all to read it at the same time. How many of you would enjoy that? You'd hear the gibberish, right? I'd be speaking about Romans, you'd be speaking about Philippians, uh, and someone would be speaking about some young man would be speaking about the Song of Solomon, who's going to get married next week. You know, so you got all this going on, right? And there'd be chaos, right? So when I read the Bible privately, it edifies me. And my friends, that's so important. Every day, get into the Word. It, it builds you up. Now, if I read the Bible and no one else is reading it, but we're reading together, now my public reading, you're edified. Do, do you see the difference, folks? So when you pray in your private prayer language, you're edified. But don't all be doing it at once unless you interrupt each other, unless there's an interpretation, which is, that's about the public gift. We're talking about the private grace this morning. Okay, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Now, there's something that's very interesting. How many of you ever heard say, "Don't speak, you should not speak in tongues in church. It's wrong. It's all the devil. It's all the devil. Well, I have bad news for you and good news for you. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and what? Do not what? Forbid. Speak in tongues. Now, listen, I didn't write this, okay? This is in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, the God says, do not forbid it. Then why on earth do we forbid it? Because we're scared of it. I don't want to just take away the fear of it. My friend, it's a blessing. Is it the end all, get all? Absolutely not. But what it is, speaking in tongues, is like taking a billow and fanning the flame of the Spirit inside of you, and it would, that helps you to become more sensitive to all the spiritual gifts. And it builds you up. How many of you could be built up? All right. Which? Brings me to my second point. Why pray in tongues? It's scriptural. It's a benefit. Now, what would happen if someone called you tomorrow, a headhunter called you up, say, hey, listen, I got a new job for you. What is it? We're going to pay you $150,000 a year and a $65,000 benefit package, benefit package. You say, no, thank you. I, I don't need the benefits. Just give me the, the salary. Would you do that? No, we all want the bennies, right? I heard people say, oh, what do you work? I, work at, I work at this place. I only get paid $5 an hour, but the bennies are great. I always talk to the people at Costco. You know, I love the Costco employees. And they got the best benefits around. They get paid $55,000 a year for being a cashier, six weeks vacation, full dental, full health. I'm like, man, you know, they go, we got great bennies here. That's why they never leave, you know. They got great bennies. We want the bennies, right? No, I don't need any benefits. Just give me the salary. Of course not. Well, there's so many benefits about speaking in tongues and why pray. It's a benefit. It builds you up. No, I'm built up enough. I don't want any more building up. If I build up any more, I'm not going to be able to stand it. Is anyone doesn't want to be built up anymore? Am I the only person that wants to be built up? 
How do you know that the world's beating you up all the time? We all need to be built up. So when you pray in tongues, it builds you up. When you read the scriptures, it what? Builds you up. When you spend time with the Lord, it builds you up. It's a great thing to be built up. And so, um, and so what it says is the Bible is not telling you, the Bible is not telling you don't build yourself up. It's saying build yourself up. Remember, Paul says, in the spirit is tongues. All right? So let's look at more scriptures about this. He who speaks in a tongue edifies, which means builds himself up. But he who prophesies edifies the church. I just gave the example of reading scripture out loud. Everyone at once, confusion, or reading it privately, getting something out of it, and reading scripture publicly, one person at a time, they benefit. Do you see the difference? Okay? So that's all part of it. Edifies to build yourself up. Bible says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. This is one of the most popular spiritual warfare. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but the principalities. It talks about it. We're in a spiritual war, folks. Make no mistake about it. And so the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6 gives us the, the armament that we need to use. He goes through a whole list of things. And I'll just start the, the list. Finally, be strong in the Lord. Be strong how? In the Lord, not yourself. In the Lord. And in the strength of your own grit, no, in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God. We need all the, why? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the enemy, right? He goes through the, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the whole thing, the shoes. And at the end of, the, of this list that we all understand, it says, put, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and... Pray in the Spirit. What does it mean when you pray in the Spirit? Praying in tongues. So it's saying, do all this and pray in tongues. At all times and on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers always. Part of a spiritual warfare is speaking in tongues. There's been times where I, don't, I have no idea what to say. I remember Sandra and I, we were separated. for. I went away someplace, and I was writing her letters and stuff, and I ran out of words. So I like, oh, honey, you're beautiful. Uh, you're, I'm not going to say what I'm going to say, but you're da-da-da-da. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. I love you. Um, you're my morning son. Uh, I sort of ran out of words. But, man, a kiss could explain a whole lot more than that letter could. Well, when you speak in tongues, well, <laughs> uh, I didn't realize how, that, how parallel that is. Okay, but when you speak in tongues, uh, what happens is you begin to express what you cannot express with words. Your spirit, God's spirit in you begins to tell you, tell God what you need. There's been times where I'm like, God, I have no idea what to do, and I began to pray in tongues, and all of a sudden, I felt myself being built up, and I started getting ideas. One time we were at a prayer meeting, a period of time, we were praying for a mission trip that was away, and they were praying in tongues. There was a bunch of believers that were together. We were together, three or four of us together were praying, and all of a sudden, they said, I, I, I just sense right now we need to pray for the sound system. So they began to pray for the sound system. We noted it on our, our, our calendar at uh, 3 o'clock or whatever time it was in the, uh, in the afternoon, we prayed. And then later on, we find out when they came back, what happened at 9 o'clock at night where our sound system broke down and we couldn't get it working? At that very moment, we were praying in the Spirit that God would do something. Stuff like that happens all the time. And I'll be praying in the Spirit, and all of a sudden, God will drop one of your names in my heart, and I'll send you a text or I'll give you a phone call. What it does, it just builds you up spiritually. How many of you want to be built up, right? That's a good thing, right? Do you want benefits? If not, then go to your boss tomorrow and say, you know what? I've decided to make it all the same. I want my salary, but I want no benefits. Of course you want benefits. We all need benefits. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith. How? Praying in what? The Holy Spirit. It's a praying in the... This is Jude. Build yourself up. I need to be built up, and you need to be built up. And that's all part of the process. You know, a lot of people would say, I would love to speak in, in, in a prayer language, but I don't have the gift. I just don't have the gift. You know, the Bible says, no. Well, my friend, it's available to everybody. You can have the gift. Well, if God decides to give me the gift, he'll just give it to me. Okay, that's what's going to happen. He's just going to give it to me. If God wants me to have it, he'll give it to me. Why should I worry? Which brings me to my final point. It's this. It's scriptural. It's a benefit, and it's a choice. That's correct. It's a choice. God is not some God up there that's going to make you do something crazy. You're going to be, all of a sudden, you're going to be in Costco 
or better yet, you're going to be in, um, in Stop and Shop. And all of a sudden, <laughs> you, you, know, <laughs> you grab the microphone, you start speaking in tongues. <laughs> I mean, is that going to happen? You know, all of a sudden, you're going to start speaking in tongues and stop and shop. You can't control yourself. No, that's not going to happen. It's a choice. You make a choice. Let me explain to you through the Scriptures what it has to say about this. It's this. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will. What does I will mean? What does will mean? I will make a choice. I will pray. And by the way, in Greek, will means, means choice. I will is will. I will pray with the Spirit. And I will also pray with understanding. I will sing. I will eat lunch when I'm done with this. Okay? Praise God. If you want to come to the Grove Track 301, we'd love to have you come. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with understanding. It is a choice. You're not God, the Holy Spirit's not going to fall on you in the middle of Kroger or, or in the middle of... Um, of Publix, if you're in, um, in Florida, or Stop and Shop, I'm doing it for the folks that are watching in different places, you know, he's not going to fall on you, you're going to grab the microphone, or and you say, well, that's not my gift. Well, imagine that you're walking out of here today, we have these little boxes against the wall, so if you forget to give your offering, and all of a sudden, you, you're like, you just start walking here, and all of a sudden, a check flies out of your pocket, and a pen automatically writes for you, and it, it falls into the box. Oh, I must have the gift of giving now. That's not how it works. You got to say, God, I'm going to trust you. You get out your pen, you write, or you text it in, right? It's a choice. And so God will give you a choice. It's a choice you make. And that's all part of it. If you have the gift of teaching, you have to be walking, all of a sudden you're trying to find cornflakes. <gasps> and you go over, you, you run into the information desk, you say, I need to start teaching. I have the Holy Spirit on me. And you start teaching in the middle of stop and shop. That's not going to happen, right? You control it. So that's what happens. The Apostle Paul says, it's not uncontrollable. All through, if it was uncontrollable, then why would he have to give his steps how to operate the Holy Spirit? Let one speak at it one at a time. Pray privately. He's giving us instructions. Why? Because it's controllable. You allow the Holy Spirit to come or you can shut off the Holy Spirit into your own ideas. So it's scriptural. It's available. It builds you up. Why wouldn't you want that? Some have said, well, I've tried, and it sounds like gibberish. It just sounds like gibberish to me. When I tell you about the two boys, or my, my, my daughter and Luke speaking, it's only gibberish. See? When I first started to pray, I, I got a couple of phrases, and, I, and first my dad prayed for me, a little, and private, by the way. They tried publicly, and they did private. I'm more of a private kind of guy. And they prayed for me, and all of a sudden, my, my, my tongue got heavy, and I began to speak in syllables. And it was, it was like, wow, I just felt like liquid love come on me. And I, I did it for like about a year or two. And then all of a sudden, I, I kind of fell away from God. I didn't fall into sin, but I stopped reading my Bible. I got kind of, I turned to a teenager and, you know, all that kind of happened. I, stopped, I started doubting. Ah, oh, that's not of God. And it wasn't until I was in my early 20s that I began again. And let me tell you, it really, really, really helps. I know a lot of people would say, well, it sounds like gibberish. Well, listen, you start off. My dad said when he first started speaking in tongues, he, my dad's really a thinker. You know, he thinks things to death. He does. And I, I, sometimes I'm the same way. And, and, and he had a hard time. My mother got it right away. My dad had a struggle with it. And then he started speaking. I don't like the way it sounds. So he asked God to change it, and he did. And now it's back to, and he went back the other way one again. And, uh, you know, and I hear people say this. Well, I'm afraid if I open myself to tongues, I might open myself to an evil spirit. Have you ever heard that before? I might open myself to an evil spirit. I don't want an evil spirit to come on me. So, I, you know, people that speak in tongues, it could be an evil spirit. I don't want that. The Bible says do not forbid it, right? And so, um, very interesting. How can you open yourself up to an evil spirit? You know, Jesus thought of this, by the way. In, in, in Luke chapter 10, he talks about the, the enemy being a scorpion and a snake. That meant, that was, a, that was, a, that was talking about the enemy, right? Well, we're in the next scripture here. Jesus talks about it in Luke. He says the following. If a son asks for bread we, from the Father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will he give him a serpent? Serpent would mean the devil. So if you ask God for a gift, he's not going to give you the devil. I mean, what child would do this? Say, Dad, I want a piece of pizza. <laughs> you want a piece of pizza? <laughs> you have a scorpion. You know, I mean, how ridiculous is that? Come on. 
Or if he asks for an egg, <laughs> will he give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give gifts, give the Holy Spirit to some of those, no, to those who ask of him? So please understand, when you ask God for something, God, I want to speak in tongues, I want to lay hands on the sick and recover, God's like, oh, good. <laughs> He'll give you a demon. That's not what happens. <laughs> Is that some Scooby-Doo voice up in heaven? <laughs> God wants to bless us. It's real simple, right? You ask for it, He gives it to you. It's that simple. You don't walk in faith. I'm going to ask the worship team to get their self ready, please. Apostle Paul says, when you pray in a tongue, your spirit prays. You know, there's sometimes I pray in the spirit, I feel nothing. But you know what? It's a gift. God gives all the gifts. All gifts are available to all believers. You may not have the public gift of tongues, but you have the private grace of prayer language. It's available to everybody. I like what the Apostle Paul says here. You know, how many ever have trouble with your tongue? I know I do. I say the wrong thing. All right. In the book of James, it says, who can control the tongue? But you know what the beautiful thing is? When you speak in tongues, you let God, I give you the wheel. And you let God speak it through you. Well, how do you speak in tongues? How? Do you just make something up? Fake it till you make it? No. What you do is very simply, you ask the Father. God, I, I just pray you'd fill me with the Holy Spirit. He says, if you ask, you receive. It's like salvation. You give your life to Christ. And I want to encourage you to do, we'll have an opportunity here this morning, we're going to lock the doors, you're not going to leave until you all speak in tongues. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. But I encourage you to do something that would help me out. Get by yourself. I mean, people say, where's Pastor? He's out in the woods someplace. I like to get by myself. And I like to, I like to talk to God like I'm talking to you right now. I like to raise my voice. I'm just, you know, I just, I'm German, and I'm, I'm also Italian. I get the passion part of me. And the German parts write things down, and the German part yells things out, okay? I like to get by myself and talk to God. I'll talk to him like I am right now. I'll speak in tongues loud. You know, I do it private, but it's private for me. It's something I build myself up. I get by myself. Get by yourself. Put on some praise and worship and say, God, I'm going to walk in faith. I'm going to open my mouth. I'm going to step out. A good friend of ours at the church, Kevin Merchant, teaches swing lessons. And he says it's so easy. He, he likened it because he prayed for many years to receive the Holy Spirit and also the gift of speaking in tongues and, and, and the prayer language. He had a hard time with it. He said, Pastor, I he finally got it. He said, you know what it's like? It's like what I'm trying to teach someone to swim. They try so hard, and, they, and the harder they try, the more they sink to the bottom of the pool. But when they relax and let the water take them, it happens. My friends, I encourage you to do the same with the Holy Spirit. But I've tried. Listen, you're not a bad person because you don't do it. Please. God loves everyone. It's available to everyone. You know what the Bible says? I wish you all spoke with tongues. Why would the Holy Spirit say, I wish you? If you couldn't, you can. You wish all of you. It's a private, and again, this is not the public gift. This is the private grace. Why would I want to do it? Do you not want to be built up inside? I want to be built up. I want to help exercise more self-control, more of the gift of the Spirit so I can pastor my family and pastor the church and lead myself better, right? I wish you all, my, my prayer, I wish you all would speak in tongues, and you can. You can. But you got to ask, and you got to walk in faith. So go home, get some music, whatever, and get by yourself. And if you're driving the car, keep your eyes open, keep your hands in the wheel. But you can just start praying to the Lord and say, Lord, I just pray, I bless you, I honor you, and I'm going to step out in faith right now. It's like Peter stepping out of the boat. Okay, I'm going to step out. And just let your tongue go and dis disconnect. It's like, like uh, my friend Kevin Merchant said. It's like knowing how to float. You just got to just let it happen and let it out. Oh, you say two things. I'm only, saying, I'm only saying two syllables. Well, guess what? When my little baby said to me, Dad, da, da, da. Stop it. Speak full sentences. What's wrong with you? I want to hear the Gettysburg address. No. Da, 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 da. Mama, no, da, 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 da. Dad, 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 it's easy to say, right? What was he saying? Dad, dad, dad. I'd come home and my little son, my daughter would come up to me and go, Dad, would I reprimand that child for doing that? No, I'd pick the child up and say, I love you. That's what God wants to do with you. Develop your gift. My friend, it's for everybody. 
We want to be a church that operates in the full fullness of God. We need it in these last days. We're living in the world's crazy. We need to surrender ourselves to the Lord. I'm going to pray right now with you. By the way, this need, you need to give your life to Christ first. That's the most important thing you can do. Have you given your life to Christ? Maybe you know about God. You can talk about God. Maybe you can teach about God. But have you actually said, I'm resigning from being the boss of my life? And I declare that God is the boss of my life. And Lord, I believe, I believe you died on the cross. I ask you to forgive all my sins. You cannot forgive yourself. God can forgive you. Today can be your day where you can start a new day today. It's not what you do. It's what he's done for you. All you have to do is put faith and trust in what he's done for you. If I'm going to fly you to Florida, get Disney World, whatever, and I say, and I bring you to the airport, and I say to you, I got your ticket right here. Do you see? The, I, I, I see the plane. I see Delta Airlines. I see it right there. It's right there. It's sponsored the New York Yankees. There's Delta Airlines. Okay, I see it. I believe in it. Why don't you get on the plane? No, I'm a little afraid of flying. I don't know. I'm not going to get on that plane. You can't get on the plane until you what? Get on the plane. <laughs> Okay? And you have to what? Trust, walk on the plane, sit down, and let the plane take you. It's the same thing about salvation. You believe Jesus exists, but you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something right now. He's the most kind. He's the most wonderful God you would ever have. He wants the best for you. You think you know what's best? All these shortcuts, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do what I want, and it ends up hurting you. God wants the best for you, folks. Bible says, for God so wanted to judge the world. No, for God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. Now is the time to come to him. Aren't you tired of doing it yourself? Why not just give up your life to the creator that made you who knows what's best for you? Let's pray. Let's all bow our heads if we could. If you want to repeat after me in your own heart, say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the son of God and you paid the price for all of my sins. Today, I ask you to forgive me of all of my wrong things I've ever done, Lord. All the bad things I've done, the bad things I've said, I ask you to forgive me of all those things. And as I best I know how, I give you my life just the way I am right now. Help me to learn to be full in you. I give my life to you today. Take over my life. I am yours in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, can you just show me, Pastor, I prayed that prayer just real quick some hands and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Three or four of you ready? Anyone watching at home or wherever you're at? Come on. I think there's at least one more person this morning. Say, Pastor, thank you. Come here. Amen. Listen. Can I have your eyes real quick again, please? Do we have a connection card? Get a hold of one, please. It says here, I accepted Jesus Christ as the first time or I, I recommitted my life, recommitted my life to Christ. I want to ask you to fill that out. Okay. And next week, step one, we're going to show you how you can have a vibrant life in Christ. But we want to help. We want to send you something to help you out. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. But I want to pray for you right now to receive more of the Holy Spirit. Can we do that? Let's all stand if we could. We sang that song, we raise the white flag. We surrender all to you. Are you willing to surrender your lack of understanding and your fear to the Lord right now? I'm going to pray right now. If you'll pray after me right now, God will touch you. Why? Why does it say that? It says this. If you then, being evil, know how to give. Okay, it says right here. Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. If you ask, you will receive. The whole passage is about asking and receiving. So let's go ahead and just pray right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. You said not to leave unless we're filled with you. Lord, I realize today, Jesus, you were filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled. You said you'd fill me and baptize me with the Holy Spirit. I ask you right now to fill me with the Holy Spirit. I receive all that you have for me, all the spiritual gifts and the grace to build myself up in my prayer language. I receive it in faith today. In Jesus' name. 
in Jesus' name. If you want more prayer, come forward. We're going to ask the worship team to lead us in a closing song. If you want to just take a few moments, we'll leave this open here today. There's no reason to rush out. We'll dismiss you as a general. But if you want to spend some time here and get prayer for, for whatever you need for, not just the Holy Spirit, but anything else, we want to pray with you. Okay? We raise our white flag. We surrender. you today. May he follow you. Let's be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you want prayer, please come forward. Go home. Try this, folks. It's for everybody. Let's build ourselves up. Let's increase our gifts in the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. You want a prayer? Please come forward. Otherwise, we dismiss you quietly. Thank you.